All right, everybody, welcome once again to the, the podcast, The Problem, uh, with me, John Stewart. Uh, the TV show is back on Apple TV Plus. Season two, uh, last week's episode, I guess, Gender, is, is, it's on there for free, for God's sakes. What a gracious and lovely group of people we are. Uh, today, we're excited. We're checking in with one of our season one guests, Securities and Exchange uh, Commission Chair, Gary Gensler. He was on uh, when we were discussing the stock market. And by the way, we did put out an inquiry to our online community, and they sent back just thousands of uh, really interesting, really well thought out questions. And I will do my best to bring the gist of those questions to uh, the head of the Securities and Exchange Commission. I, I won't do justice, I'm sure, to how thoughtful and, and specific they are, but I will do my best to, to bring those larger points to him. Sir, Commissioner, welcome back. It's good to be with you, John. Are you, do you go by Commissioner? I, most people call me Gary, but if you want to use an honorific, it's usually Chair. Well, thank you. I'm going to go with the commish. I'll go with chair. All right, chair is good. Uh, Gary, last time we talked, you, you had discussed, you know, uh, how important it was to bring fairness and transparency. Last time we talked a lot about retail and, and we had opened up actually our account to get questions for you. And, and obviously the majority of them, I think, were still retail guys and focused on the kinds of things that I think you're very familiar with. So we can talk about that in a little bit. But, you know, basically we talked about backroom financial instruments, holding bad actors accountable, uh, these types of things. Can you give us an update from the SEC's perspective on where we stand now? I think you were, you were doing a lot of hiring and kind of gearing up to make the types of adjustments that you thought would bring more, more fairness, and, and more accountability to the market. So, so what you got? So I, I thank you, John, for inviting me back. And I thank your listeners for tuning in. Over the course of, it's been about a year since we were together, mm -hmm. uh, our agency put out an agenda. It had 50 or 55 items on it. Our total capital markets, most people think of the stock market, but our total capital markets are about $100 trillion in size. Mm -hmm. Our stock market's about 40 or 45% of that. But across that whole capital markets, we put out this agenda and we have made proposals in about two thirds of the areas. And critically for some of your listeners in terms of the stock market, we put out proposals with regard to more transparency about short selling, more transparency about where one mm -hmm. borrows stock and that's called securities borrowing, but that's inside, it's really important. We put out proposals about insiders of big companies selling their stock. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we have not yet put out and we're getting close to is putting out some proposals about uh, the core of the stock market, which I'm gathering you'll probably ask me more about, so I won't get ahead. Right. But again, I feel really good. We've got a great team in place. Mm -hmm. uh, their challenge is Absolutely. I wish we were a bigger agency. I wish we hadn't shrunk during the prior administration. We've had a robust enforcement agenda as well. And I think uh, we can get into that when we're talking a little bit more. You've put out some proposals. Uh, give us a little sense of what's the difference between proposals and rulemaking and, and what's the process of a first of all, as we spoke earlier, you you agreed, you know, it's not a level playing field. Uh, in the market. It's not a level playing field. It, yep. it, let me step back a little bit. So sure. Congress writes the laws. <laughs> we, we What? Well, wait a minute. Yeah. And how does a bill become a law? We, the Securities and Exchange Commission, we were set up about nine decades ago in the 1930s. And we do our rulemaking based upon what authorities Congress has given us. And then through mm -hmm. something called the Administrative Procedures Act. No, don't, don't, not off. I know you probably never studied this in high school civics. Uh, and it's, it's really an important thing that the only way we can do rule writing is we put together a proposal within our mm -hmm. authority from Congress. We have to do a bunch of economic analysis around efficiency and competition and capital formation, put that all together, put it out to public comment. Mm -hmm and then hear back from the public before we can actually then go forward to finalize a rule. And as I said, in terms of 
those listening, it's really helpful to hear from you. And especially- Oh, I got, I got questions, man. We put it out on, on Reddit, YouTube, and, and Twitter. We got questions, baby. When we put proposals out to hear mm -hmm. from the public, and particularly as we're getting closer to putting proposals out about so trying these to level the playing the public field phase? to hear from the public, or on what we've already put out on short selling and stock borrowing and insiders mm -hmm. trading in their own stock, uh, you know, senior executives, to hear from the public. And then we take all that in to try to finalize a rule. Right. In your mind is the idea that you go through the proposal phase, then there's the public phase, uh, and then it goes to possible rulemaking. And the idea is all that takes long enough that a new administration comes in and then they don't have to deal with it anymore. Is that the general? Well, the real idea is uh -huh. to promote our three-part mission. Capital formation, investor confidence. What else you got? What's the third well, pillar? Well, I, actually, I think of it as protecting investors first. That's what Congress put in place first, protecting mm -hmm. investors. Yes, you're right about facilitating capital formation. That's people raising money. And that can even be sure. you who takes out an auto loan or takes out a mortgage. You're raising money in that regard. Mm. But then it's that which is in the middle. That which is in the middle is we have part of our mission to promote fair, orderly, and efficient markets. Well, if we promote something in the middle to be lower cost, that's better for investors. And it's actually better for issuers. It's usually the middle, though, says, wait a minute, I'm, I'm earning less. But mm -hmm. most of what we're trying to do, and, and I'm a market guy, and yes, John, I worked on Wall Street for 18 years early in my career, is trying to ensure that the middle is more efficient. That means lower cost if you're an investor and you want to invest in the stock market. If you have lower cost in the middle, that's good. So for you're you. talking about a balance between, let's say, uh, the cost of entering the stock market versus uh, what the best execution would be, the liquidity, you know, all the, all the grease that keeps the stock market moving. The middle of the market is almost like the neck of an hourglass. Just, just visualize this for a minute. Hold on. Think of an hourglass and all- Are you saying the stock market is Zoftig? Is that what, what I'm hearing? No, no, I'm saying that right. if you think about the financial market, it's mm -hmm. like, Billions or even trillions of grains of sand flow through every single day. Every right. day, trillions mm -hmm. of dollars of transactions. Mm -hmm. And Wall Street and finance and the city of London and so forth sit at the neck of the hourglass. If an agency like ours can make that neck of the hourglass more transparent, more competitive, less mm -hmm. costly, that's good for the people on each end of the hourglass. All right. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's get sand. to that. The sand Let, is money and risk. It, what you've done so far is create a beautiful, that's a beautiful metaphor. And I think many people right now are imagining the, the hourglass in, in their minds. But let's, let's get to and that. And our job so, is to try to lower the cost in the middle. It's yes. one of our jobs. And make it and fair to the folks at each end of the market. Overwhelmingly. Uh, the questions that we got related to transparency, sort of these backroom financial instruments, lit market versus not lit market, and keeping it transparent. Naked shorting was one of the biggest, uh, in terms of the the commentary that we got, and, and this will go along with the framing of most of the questions. What's the difference between counterfeiting money and market maker exempted naked shorts coupled with FTDs? I mean, basically, uh, uh, the point of it being, I think if if you don't have the transparency and you can just uh, be overselling the shorts and people don't understand or can't see, let's say you've got five banks doing, you know, 50% of the, the market shorts and they don't even hold uh, those shares in and of themselves. How do you bring transparency to that? And, and what's the difference between that and just having a, a printing press of money? So uh, let me say, I, I agree with your uh, listeners and folks that wrote in, we need more mm -hmm. transparency and better transparency about a, a really core part of the market is when somebody sells securities they don't own, that's called Correct. shorting. You might say, mm -hmm. well, how do they do that? Well, you have to borrow somebody's securities uh, to sell it what's called short. 
You don't have you don't have that stock. You're you're betting on it. Uh, and co- and by the way, Congress agrees with this. Congress 12 years ago said we should have more transparency in this mm-hmm. arena as well. I came on board last year and we still had not done one of the rules that Congress mandated that we do after the financial crisis. Uh, right. There were eight rules we hadn't yet done. I don't know why, John, but we're getting those done. And one of them is greater transparency in this short selling, but also greater transparency when you have to borrow the securities. We put those out Correct. late last year. So what's what's the rule now for transparency that's going to be implemented? So, well, I can't prejudge it because we didn't finalize it, but what we basically are saying is that on the, the borrowings, borrowing those securities, that that market would be much more transparent and you would you would get on a, on a regular basis, we, we actually proposed something that would be happening throughout the day. Right. Um, a lot of commenters okay. said that's too, too, too. Uh, Cause now often. there's what a two week lag. There's a two week lag right now on short selling. Mm-hmm. There's actually not public disclosure yet on the stock borrowing. So we, we wanted to address both sides of it. No public disclosure. There are some private data feeds where you can pay for it, but we we are, <laughs> there, we are proposing- There you go. That sounds fair and transparent. We are proposing a role or did propose a role where that yes. transparency would happen uh, on a regular basis throughout the day uh, on that stock borrowing. Mm-hmm. And then on the short selling, uh, additional uh, disclosure there as well. So these these proposals, uh, to bring that in there, you know, that's obviously uh, a much slower process. Can't you use enforcement to uh, bring consequences to companies that have already, like, for instance, uh, let's say UBS, right? So UBS, uh, I guess, was selling stock they didn't have and and not delivering the stock. And I guess the two day, I guess there's a two day period where you have to deliver the stock within there. And you guys have proposed to take it down to one day. But so for nine years, they've been doing that. They were caught. Uh, You know, and obviously it's a step in the right direction, but uh, they were fined, I think, $3 million. Was that it for for that nine year uh, period? So I I don't have the exact figure in front of me, but let me step away from one case. It's $3 million. I have it in front of me. It's $3 million. Well, I I trust that- Nine nine years, $3 million. So we're a cop on the beat. Uh, Our agency is about 4,500 people strong. Mm -hmm. About half were in examinations or enforcement. But even right. the, the, the folks, that's about 2,400 of the folks in examining uh, financial actors to ensure that they're complying with the rules, and then mm-hmm. an enforcement division uh, that brings seven plus hundred cases a year mm-hmm. uh, during the year. And the short selling rules on the books are really important, but I don't think they go far enough. I'm saying we have proposed things to go further. But in no, terms in terms of our current enforcement uh, authorities, uh, if somebody is not complying with the law or the rules that our predecessors put in place, mm-hmm. then we are a cop on the beat. But I'd also say to your listeners, bring that in. You asked me the last time we were together about crowdsourcing. I know you sure. didn't really, you didn't probably uh, uh, embrace with a warm hug my answer, but I think it really is important that uh, you call it crowdsourcing. I call it tips, complaints, and referrals. I call mm-hmm. it whistleblowers, uh, bringing things into us. We we get about 45,000 tips, complaints, and referral per right. year. UBS, we only have 1,300 people in our enforcement right. division. You can see it's a little outsized. We should be bigger. But UBS is is obviously, they're, they're a big player, UBS. And so if, if I'm bringing you that tip, let's say I bring you a tip that UBS for nine years hasn't been delivering uh, uh, the stocks, and the only penalty they face, you can imagine UBS probably made billions of dollars, you know, of this type of practice, and if the penalty is only $3 million, that's not even a slap on the wrist. I mean, if I knew that crime paid that well, I would, 
you know, well, I mean, I'm a comedian, so I guess crime does pay well. That is so, so basically I, still. I, I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not going to dive into those specifics of that case, but mm -hmm. in general, in general, what we're allowed to do as an agency is seek what's called disgorgement. So if, if a firm, mm -hmm. any firm or any individual uh, has to disgorge their profits. So if, if you made a hundred million dollars uh, right. uh, uh, after expenses, you know, you've got a net of a hundred million, then mm -hmm. we can go after that to what's called disgorgement. You give it up. And then in addition, penalties. Now, it is, it is the case that often we uh, have disputes with uh, defendants about what their profits were and mm -hmm. are. And our economists go in and try to chase that down and really get the facts and build mm -hmm. a case. And often it can take two and three years to build that case. Again, it's why I think we're under-resourced. And, and I'm, I'm addressing that people, larger point. That's what we do. We do. We look right. at. And so, uh, again, your hypothetical, if somebody was making a billion dollars in your hypothetical, then we would say, you've got to disgorge that. And we've had cases in this past year where we have held people accountable, companies as big as the Allianz Insurance Company uh, mm -hmm. uh, is an example. Uh that was significant. In fact, this, this past fiscal year, uh, we in the federal government have a year that ends September 30th. Don't ask me. I don't know why, but, you know, it's mm -hmm. a fiscal year ending September 30th. And our uh, disgorgements and penalties added up to in excess of $6 billion, which was up uh, the, the prior year was about $4.5 billion. So, the, the last 12 months, we have definitely uh, seen that go up in some really important cases, whether it's uh, holding a bunch of large banks accountable for using off-channel communications, using WhatsApp in their books and records area, having right. f folks, um, as I say, in the sort of complex products area like Allianz in a, in a big way, or, or whether it was companies, companies who were issuers that misled their public in their filings. Boeing, I mean, it was tragic as to what happened with the, 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 air, the airplane, the, the faulty uh, uh, technology, but uh, that they misled the public, oh, everything's all right. And uh, or or even in in the, uh, the well, that's companies where the, that the are greenwashing, greenwashing right. there and saying we're green when maybe they're not so green. Do you have confidence that Congress uh, has any interest in this, given their own history with insider trading to a, to a large extent? I mean, uh, if you're a sitting representative or senator and you're in committee meetings discussing what's going to happen with COVID and then you walk out of that meeting and you unload, uh, you know, any of your stocks that may have to do with the pandemic or you buy up things that you know is happening, you know, uh, 75 federal lawmakers, I think, uh, bought and sold in the early weeks of the pandemic. When you're bringing this idea of fairness to the markets and people are seeing no accountability for lawmakers, some accountability in terms of fine, uh, uh, fines and, and disgorgements for uh, the bigger players. But I think they're not seeing movement on those that they think control the markets and are the bigger players in the markets. And so how do you prioritize that? And also, shouldn't Congress, I mean, how the hell are they allowed to hold stocks so, and, so, and trade so let me say something in equities here. when they've got, uh, I mean, you it, have the authority to clarify those laws, yes? Yeah. So let me say something unambiguous. Insider trading laws, mm -hmm. meaning trading on material, non-public information, that applies Correct. to everybody, whether you're working at a company, whether you're not working, whether you're in government, whether you're in Congress, and we, the Securities and Exchange Commission, mm -hmm. uh, have been and will be and will continue to be a cop on the beat on that, on, on trading, on material, non-public information, which is right. uh, not allowed under the law. That's called insider trading. And, but if you and look so at you know, there's a whole there's a whole feed on Paul Pelosi's stock trades. They say if you follow his stock trades, you'll kill the market. You know, uh, uh, Kelly Loeffler, I don't know, she unloaded millions in stocks after a briefing 
on, uh, you know, COVID-19 and then downplayed the severity of the virus and nothing happened to her. You know, nothing happens to uh, Congress people where it's, it's very clear that they're profiting from the knowledge that they have inside the government. Well, again, um, I can't, I can't speak to any one matter. Mm -hmm. The the SEC is a law enforcement agency and it's called civil law enforcement rather than criminal law. That's what the department of justice does though. We team up, we team up quite often with the department of justice. Right. Um, but it's really to, instill greater trust in the SEC that we don't talk about individual cases that may be under investigation or may not be under investigation uh, until they're actually finalized and if we actually bring the action. And that that's really to be, be fair to the whole market and the market participants. But on your core issue, on your core issue, right. if somebody is trading on material non-public information, information, uh, you know, that, that comes from those uh, companies or occasionally comes from inside the government. Right. And uh, uh, that's against the law and we will chase that. And again, uh, uh, contact the SEC if you see that. But we have held members of Congress accountable. We have mm-hmm. brought cases. If the facts and the law take us there in the future, uh, we will unfortunately do it again. But right. it's how you instill trust. It's how you have trust in the capital markets. It's the same reason why we have this proposal outstanding about insiders at companies. Do you think that the penalties for uh, the types of shenanigans that we're talking about, whether it be naked short selling uh, or insider information being used by people in power to gain profit or any of those things, do you think that the consequences that they faced and the speed at which they face them does bring confidence to people in the markets. I understand the public's frustration here and I Mm. I share that frustration, uh, John. We have certain tools as an agency, penalties are one of them, disgorgement, I distinguish, disgorgement is giving back the ill-gotten gain Penalty is what you add on top of it. But I think mm-hmm. it's also about individual accountability, holding individuals accountable, not just their, their firm. I mean, you can bring a case against a big multi-billion dollar bank and sometimes they'll say, let's just settle for the penalty, even a hundred mm-hmm. million dollar penalty and move on. And so actually holding individuals accountable Mm -hmm. And I would also say two other things. We put out these orders, they're called, uh, um, but the orders tell the narrative, tell the background and the facts. I did this in the Obama administration when I was honored to chair another federal agency, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Often even the telling of those facts are really important so that the public understands what is happening. And then lastly, sometimes also what's called undertakings, that they commit for X number of years to change certain key behavior. I think Mm -hmm. it's all of that. And then sometimes working with the Department of Justice and the criminal authorities to send people to jail. Give me an example when that happened to your satisfaction, because like I'll look at, you know, these situations and yeah, you're right. It's 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 frustrating to look at these actors that continue to uh look for loopholes and and they certainly have the finances. I mean, a lot of their lawyers are former SEC employees, but so let, let's say for instance, Archegos. I mean, that was a, a, uh, a small company that over leveraged, right. And, and uh, nearly blew up the major media company. Yes. So, so let me, let me uh, say two things. One is lawyers, accountants, investment bankers that are listening to this podcast at Mm -hmm. 6 a.m. or whenever you put it out. These gatekeepers have a role and a responsibility under the law. And Mm -hmm. I would say this, if your client is asking you something right up against the line and you're sort of saying, you know, you can structure it this way or that way, my advice to you is tell them, no, step back from the line. Don't try to uh, find a loophole or what's called arbitrage. Um, I think of it the duck test. I'm sorry to speak of it this way, but if it right. w- 
waddles like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. But don't you think they know that it's a duck? I mean, that's the whole point. But that's, it's very, I think it's troubling to hear the SEC chairman say, our, our goal is to have Wall Street people appeal to their better angels. No, no, that's, because they're, they, what I'm saying, John, is gatekeepers have a role as well. And we've held gatekeepers, including big accounting firms, Ernst & Young and, and, and uh, uh, Deloitte this year. Uh, I, I mean, my God, one of them was actually cheating on their own internal ethics exams. And so, uh, yes, it's true. But that's, and I so, mean, that's the so story of So I'm saying the this. gatekeepers have a role. I know, but without accountability, they're not going to play that role. So this is just a bit of a message to the gatekeepers through your podcast. Uh, it's all I'm saying. On Archegos- Are you saying you're coming for them? We already have, and we will continue to. They have responsibilities. You asked about a case called Archegos. I can speak about that because we brought charges, but it's in litigation right now. Mm -hmm. A family office- uh, that grew quite large through a use of a, a complex product called securities-based swaps, or sometimes called total return swaps. Right. Where that are that are not transparent as to the size of of them. Correct. They are not transparent as to the size, and that's again yeah. why we made one of these proposals. One of those thirty-six proposals is in this area around transparency of large trader positions in securities-based swaps. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can imagine there has been some pushback, um, as there's been pushback on others of our proposals. I think right. that, that that it's in the in the right direction. What is the pushback against that? Why would why would anyone suggest that uh, someone should be able to take large positions in that without revealing them? Some of the commenters say we put the thresholds too low, and should they be a bit higher? And uh, some of the pushback is that we said that it had to be reported the very next day and whether it should be a, a handful of days uh, uh, later or even at the end of the month. A handful of days, though, is but on that's Arkegos, such a glacial pace. On Kegos, we also brought charges with the criminal authorities about the, uh, the leadership there that yes. they had been uh, defrauding and misleading their counterparties, the big banks. Now I know, I know your listeners might think, ah, oh, that's a, but it was between this family office that was measured in the tens of billions of dollars mm -hmm. that was misleading their counterparties, the big banks, through these total return swaps, and we have alleged also manipulating the market. At this point, uh, do you believe? that the litigation will be successful against the rules uh, or that these people will go to jail or that some accountability will be brought to this uh, in a timely fashion? I'm a chair of a five member commission. I voted on that action. I definitely believe in that action. I can't speak about further about the ongoing litigation, but if I can go mm -hmm. more broadly, more broadly, I do mm -hmm. believe that our mission about protecting those investors first of right. yes, capital formation and the the fairness and orderliness of that middle, the efficiency of the middle, the markets, mm -hmm. that, that this has been part of our economic success over the last 90 years. It is not perfect. Is the SEC underfunded? Yes. And doesn't, this, doesn't it play a role in kind of the boom and bust? Are these markets, are these markets nuanced and, and uh, textured? And are there teams of lawyers outside? For every lawyer we have, Mm -hmm. There's multiple lawyers outside that are thinking, all right, maybe I can advise my client to do it this way or that way. And that's why I also focus on the gatekeepers. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, here's one that, that I think people were really curious about. And this was another one of the large kind of tranche of questions that we got. Uh, I'm not even going to tell you what the name of the person is whose account this is because it's filthy. But Jackie Le hmm, said, uh, for the love of God, ask about GameStop, dark pools, failure to delivers, and swaps. And then uh, Pat Arokin on Reddit, this is concerning dark pools. How can anyone know the value of anything if shares are never actually bought and sold on the market, just endless IOUs that don't affect the price? And I thought that was a really uh, critical question that, that gets to kind of the heart of Everything that happens off the exchanges, I mean, this is a, a relatively new phenomenon within the stock market, but 
uh, there's the lit exchange and there's the non-lit exchange. And there's so much that goes on that people can't see. And there's so many IOUs. Look, too, I, I'm sorry. That it, was it Jackie and um, I can't remember the other? Pat. Pat. I mean, Pat. To Jackie and Pat, uh, I think you're right that, that right now uh, transactions happen on what's called the lit market. Mm -hmm. And then the, the dark market, if you wish, or dark pools. And that's two areas. There's these alternative trading systems, but then also uh, brokers that we call wholesalers or internalizers and the like. And, and John did a piece on this last year that you can go watch and has great charts on it. And Great graphics department. Good, really good graphics department. That's right. Um, and so I've asked staff, uh, and I gave a speech earlier this year, and this speech earlier this year this at, at this Piper conference, Piper Sandler, I think it was, um, mm -hmm. I gave this speech really to say, look, I everybody should be put on notice that the staff is going to be forming recommendations up to our commission around s these items. Mm -hmm. and And it's about how do we level the playing field across the markets? How do we make sure that off market in the dark pools that you have some of the same rules with regard to minimum price increment? It might sound wonky and technical, but- You're talking that, about best execution and things like that within the dark pools. Well, yes. Well, I even the asked markets. the question when I got to the SEC last year, I said, can I see our best execution rule? And they said, well, it's actually not ours. It's a self-regulatory organization called FINRA. Oh, don't even get me started on FINRA. I said, wait, wait, let, let me just understand. We, the Securities and Exchange Commission, often talk about best execution, mm -hmm. and we actually don't have one on the books. It's the self-regulatory organization, the industry group called the FINRA. So I've asked staff, I would, I would like to put out a proposal, an SEC best execution rule, an SEC update on our disclosure rules about price improvement, because they're always saying and marketing and bragging that they have price improvement. How about having mm -hmm. a little bit better disclosure on that? Uh, a, potentially a rule with regard to leveling the playing field across the markets that the dark poles have to have the same minimum increments as the lit markets. Um, oh, and by the way, maybe we can sh shrink or tighten the minimum increment, you know, there's a penny increment. Well, maybe mm -hmm. some stocks are trade at a half a penny or even a tenth of a penny, a tighter increment uh, uh, that we I should, mean, wasn't it we when should they changed those increments? What's called the access right. fees and the rebates. And then lastly, mm -hmm. one thing we're looking about is when you put an order in right now on your brokerage app, if you do mm -hmm. it on, you know, your phone or something like that, um, and it's called a market order, that market order, 90 plus percent of those market orders do not go to the lit exchange directly. Right. They go through something called payment forward or flow to these wholesalers. And so uh, we're looking at, the staff's looking at whether those market retail orders ought to mm -hmm. be put in order by order. But you, you had said last time payment forward or flow was something that you thought you know, you were looking into changing, getting rid of, and and yet I don't think that's that's what occurred. And that's it's it's a very controversial. I'll tell you what. Here here was a crazy one. We got a question from uh, Doug Sifu, who is the uh, CEO of Virtu. He came into the conversation and he said, "I want to be on with Gary, uh, discussing PFOF, and uh, he ha he has some experience in data. He would happily share." He just wants to to talk with you about it. Well, actually, if if, if anybody uh, looks at, we publish my call list on a monthly basis, and Doug has talked to me. Uh, it's on my call list from a month or two ago. Mm -hmm. um, but more specifically, any data that Doug has, or any data that Pat and Jackie, or anybody on your your following, your social media, that's helpful for us to get that data. I would say this though: that right now the system. Right mm -hmm. now, the system is tilted towards the dark market where the internalizers, right. the wholesalers are not playing by the same rules as the lit exchange. And we're trying to level that. Secondly, right. they're measuring a 
price improvement, so to speak, against a faulty measuring rod. This, this national best bid, best offer doesn't mm-hmm. have all of the trades in it. It also has to so let, stay let me, a penny let me clarify wide. That real quick. So I, Just think, that one I moment. think we've got to really right. look at, I think we have got to look rather than on any one thing is, are we getting the best price for those retail market right. orders that are coming into that brokerage app? And how right. do we get the best competition for those? And well, at the same time, is, try to level the field right. so that we, 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 we shrink some of the cost in the middle. To, to, in, in the layman's terms, you're saying the data that's been provided, the, uh, the argument that payment for order flow in the unlit markets is delivering better price improvement than uh, the general exchanges is not necessarily the correct data. That it's not, that data, it's not the whole story. It's part right. of the whole story is, is that there are different rules off exchange versus on exchange. Part mm-hmm. of it is also they're measuring against uh, uh, what's called the national best bid, best offer, but that so-called NBBO doesn't have all the trades in it. Mm-hmm. And it's limited, it's forced to be a penny wide. And so there's a lot else that's going on. So I've asked staff, I'd say, let's look past all that and say, get the best economist around, get the best advice, including advice from your followers and the Reddit filers and so forth, Mm -hmm. and say, how do we instill greater competition? It's it's like an American thing. How do we use transparency, better disclosure? Right. How about the SEC actually writing its best execution rule rather than relying on this self-regulatory organization? So why, why, why don't you then? But I think everything that you're saying, I think people at home would agree with. I think their frustration is what they view as passivity. They view that it's too slow moving and that by the time okay, you catch I, up I to them- Okay, I share that frustration. I, I'm, I'm, honored yeah. to be, I'm honored to be in serving government my third time. Uh, mm-hmm. I, John, I can't believe I'm doing it a third time. Right. Things move faster mm-hmm. at times in the private sector than they do in government. And that's our, that's our system. It's not just our constitutional system, but we at the Securities and Exchange Commission are paid to be very careful because we don't write the laws. Congress writes the laws. We have to do things through what's called notice and comment rulemaking, but also we generally and often, after we finalize a rule, that's not the end. That's, that's basically a moment where the market participants often then take us to court, take the SEC into court and said, mm-hmm. did we follow all of those procedural guidelines? Did we do our economic analysis? appropriately and did we consider everything and so uh, it is it is maybe slower uh but we're being thoughtful we're being methodical we're staying within the law and we're following the economic analysis and we when we put out proposals as we did on short selling as we did mm-hmm. on stock borrow as we did on these insiders uh corporate leaders trading very thoughtful. We're going to do the same on these equity market proposals. And, um, but I, I, don't think I people share don't think the public thoughtful, understanding. This is not, this is not a, a fast right. moving process. No, but so what they see is this, and this is, if, if I can translate some of the frustration that we see from the questions uh, that, that we got here, it's this, the process that you go through for the parts of the market that are far more consequential, whether they be dark pools, whether they be swaps, and in terms of naked selling, why not just register? You know, all that we got a lot of questions. Why not just what? Why not just register each stock purchase? So to go through registration. So uh, the idea being that uh, if you had to go through uh, a registration process in terms of naked shorting or those kinds of short sales, you wouldn't get into the situation where you would have places doing 140% of a short sell or things like that because the the shares themselves would be registered. That could eliminate some of the shenanigans. I share the view and the frustration that government moves more slowly than you wish. In terms of your question about registration, the companies, whether it be GameStop, whether it be other uh, public companies, we have seven or 8,000 registered public companies that that are registered. Mm -hmm. I think what the nature of the question is, is 
Uh, what, can, what can we do more to police the market? What can we do more to make the market uh, fair for the investing public? And um, mm -hmm. uh, part of it is this suite of rules that I hope that we uh, propose in the near term. Did you propose direct registration of shares? Is that in the in the suite of rules? You know, because, uh, uh, you know, obviously going through the broker and and the shares being held in the broker's name or things like that. I mean, I think that direct registration was trying to find a way to address maybe these larger naked shorting or, uh, you know, what they, what they perceive as uh, the lack of transparency. Wouldn't that bring some order and transparency? Sometimes when I'm in a congressional hearing, I say, I think, could we have my staff and your staff talk about this? But I think that uh, in more seriousness, I think that the companies are already registered. The GameStops and the others are already registered. So the nature of your question, I'd have to better understand or the nature of it might oh. be somebody, one of your followers question. I'd, I'd really like to better understand their thought. I, I, I think what they're saying is uh, it's a movement uh, and it is a question that, that came from the Reddit community, uh, that the movement is to directly register shares that are bought under the name of the person who buys them, the individual, oh, all right. so not I, the I broker. Now, I, okay. Look, I think, I think this is an, is an issue we're trying to get at in a, in a little bit different way. But one of, mm -hmm. the, one of the things is that uh, most shares in the U.S., the majority of shares in the U.S. are held in what's called street name. That's right. Uh, the, a, like the broker's gold, name. A Goldman or, Sachs or Robin Hood or somebody. Mm -hmm is right. owning or Fidelity is owning on behalf of their millions of customers. Mm -hmm. and, and it's just one name. And um, I don't know if that would help. And, and you, your, your follower on Reddit uh, might have a good point, and I'm going to ask staff about this, whether it would help with regard to short selling. But we are looking at this issue of street name and how to look through the street name when counting up the number of shareholders. And this is particularly important because you need to have 2,000 shareholders before you go public. And whether, mm -hmm. whether um, you know, again, uh, this is a, an observation that could somebody say, I only have 1,900 shareholders because each of those 1,900 have tens of thousands of shareholders behind them in street name. And that, that's certainly something that we're taking a look at and trying to address. It's interesting because I think we're ag agreeing on the frustration. I think, I think you're more of a believer in the system we have in place. And I guess I'm wondering if maybe we need to readdress the system in general because of how outmanned you guys are and how agile you know, these large financial companies are in terms of sneaking around. I think that I share your, your frustration and mm -hmm. I wish our agency was, had more resources unambiguously. Right. Um, I wish that, uh, in our system of democracy uh -oh. that, uh, that we'd get a little bit more, um, right. Uh, trust in, in it, but but you you did it. You did a number of, of uh, podcasts on the judicial system too, and so mm -hmm. uh, whether we bring an enforcement action and we're then taken into court, and you get a court that overturns our enforcement action, and we have like you know the industry trade groups or or the New York Stock Exchange then sue us we tend to win more than we lose, but there's always that balance. So why not go at it? If, if you believe payment for order flow is a conflict of interest within the markets, it, it, or it is it a is, conflict. then why not just ban it and, and take your chances in court? Because I think what people see is this, when the SEC pays a half a million dollars to put out a public service announcement that basically says the problem with the markets is, you know, meme investors not doing their research, or they see you go after Kim Kardashian uh, and get a fine on her crypto business. What they're really, the frustration there isn't necessarily what you're doing, it's what you're not doing. It's not putting out a $500,000 PSA warning people that are uh, uh, practicing 
the the PFOF or warning the 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 people that are not being transparent or warning why why aren't we using those resources to apply pressure and and leverage we're always warning individual retail people about hey man the market's dangerous and you don't want to get involved in this rather than saying let's make the market less dangerous so we don't have to warn people i believe that we're trying to do uh both uh this agenda uh with regard to this stock market with regard to parts of the market we haven't talked about the treasury market or mm -hmm. uh even private funds in america the reform agenda is really critical our private funds market by the way is almost as big as our entire commercial banking sector mm -hmm. it's a 21 trillion we're doing that but at the same time yes we're holding uh, people like Miss Kardashian uh, accountable, and that does send a message through the markets. We had earlier uh, kept others accountable uh, in, in the same way. I mean, Floyd mm -hmm. Mayweather and and uh, DJ uh, Khaled and Steve Seagal and so forth. But far. those are those are anomalies, and and maybe it's important, but it's certainly not important as holding UBS accountable and Goldman and, and all the larger players. We're doing both or all of the above, but within limited resources and within a judicial system that's, you know, people have rights and they're going right. to, they're going to challenge us. So but doesn't that suggest you're going after people who can't challenge you as much? In terms of the big firms in this past year, we had uh, fines for Barclays and, and other big banks in terms of, uh, violations of the securities laws as well. We held Allianz, which is right. one of the largest insurance companies and asset managers accountable. And at the same time, holding companies like Boeing accountable for misleading the public with regard to their, their airplane safety. Uh, and, and so it, it is the case, and, and I'm honored to be the 33rd chair of this agency. I talked to my nine predecessors as I was getting into this job and I talked about the jobs. I learned from them ranging the spectrum. And there were some that right. uh, were more aligned with the investors. And there were some that were more aligned maybe right. with, with industry across nine uh, uh, chairs from the last 30 plus years. But all of them said, you're never going to have enough time. You're never going to have enough resources. And one of the things that's changed over those 35 mm -hmm. years is that over the decades, we, the SEC, get challenged in court by the big banks, the big stock exchanges, the big fund companies and their trade associations more often in the 2020s than we did in the prior decades. And so we're very uh, deliberate. We're very thoughtful. We do things within the law right. and we're resource constrained. But none of this makes you think we need a different system, because if if nine predecessors have come to you and said, you will always be outmanned. Oh, I, I definitely think it would be good if we had more resources and resources would help. I think right. that it, it is appropriate to do things thoughtfully and carefully. And certainly there's changes in law, changes in law from Congress that would help as well. No question. Can I ask one broader e economy question before I let you go? Because I know you're busy or do you have to go? Sure. The larger... Uh, economic question is this. Uh, inflation is a very complex issue, uh, one that we're facing down and that threatens to unravel any progress that we made in terms of wages and in terms of employment. And it's an incredibly complicated interplay between supply chain and price index and pandemics and world events. In the United States, to battle inflation, we have, it seems, only one hammer, one dial, and that's the Fed. And it, it strikes me as, as odd that an issue as complex as inflation really boils down to one unaccountable organization, the Fed, turning a dial this way or this way. And when inflation hits, the first thing we say is, hey, man, on it, we got to kick unemployment up and slow everybody down. The profits are uh, uh, privatized and the pain is socialized. And how can that be in a capitalist system that is supposedly free market? 
I'm going to try my best to stick to my job and not to Jay's. No, and no, other no, 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 no. This is a broader. This is no, not. This is of a man who let, has let me say all the experience. Br- broader issue. Uh, I think we are living in a time right now of economic and market uncertainty. Uh, you just went through a list. Of course, there's even more than mm-hmm. than you just put on your list. I look even in the last week and a half to two weeks and see uncertainty in what's called the uh, the government bond market in the UK, the gilt market. It's a G7 right. country. And the treasuries here in the United States, they can't. And, treasur- you know. and treasuries here, not quite, not quite as choppy as what we've seen in the UK market in the last two weeks. And this is mm-hmm. part of the reason why, and it's this broad agenda, that we've included a number of projects to enhance the resiliency of our capital market. So we have five of those 50 plus projects are around the US treasury markets. And we've worked collaboratively with the US Department of Treasury and the Federal Mm -hmm. Reserve. And we put out proposals around trying to have the high frequency traders in those markets, what's called principal trading firms, register. You talked about registration earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of those firms that are trading high frequency trading in the treasury market are not currently registered as dealers. I think they ought to be. We put out a proposal on that to register the trading venues, the inner dealer brokers to have more clearing in those markets. Clearing is that central plumbing that we talked about earlier that mm-hmm. only about 13% of the treasury market is in, the cash market. That's just the nature of some of the resiliency projects. We also have uh, projects around hedge funds and what they report to the government through, through various right. quarterly filings and current filings. What I'm stepping back to say is the uncertainty in the market um, is a reminder to an agency like the SEC that one of the jobs that we have is to try to make the markets uh, more resilient when uncertain times come. I see this coming out of the United Kingdom and I go, it's a reminder about what we're doing, not only in the treasury market, but in money market funds. So it's, it's a really important reminder, your question about inflation and economic uncertainty. We at the SEC are merit neutral. And, and, and I say this often. What, is, what does that mean? It means that investors get to decide what risks they want to take. Investors, your Reddit followers or the biggest players in the market get to choose whether they want to go and buy something or sell something. But part of that is also to uh, do our best to have a market that doesn't spill out like the 08 crisis did to all of Americans. I'll close on this. My dad had a small business. Neither of my parents went to college and um, and their parents were immigrants. And mm-hmm. um, uh, he started a small business with his mustering out pay. He never had more than 35 employees. If he couldn't make payroll on a Friday, the city of Baltimore wasn't going to bail him out. He'd have to close up shop. And I think that every small business in America, every investor in America kind of gets that. I, I think people ap- appreciate that, but I think they see that that they do bear the brunt of the risk and there is no one there to bail them out, even though- No, there was no, no one who would bail Sammy Gensler out either. Exactly. But that, that was my but dad. But there's always someone there to bail out the big banks and the big brokers and all those folks. And they see the unfairness within the structure of the market. And I think that's the troubling part is we have a system that talks about resilience and yet only one side of that equation pays the full price for uncertainty. And that's Main Street. And and I think that's the unfortunate part. I'm driven by how can we make the markets more competitive, transparent, efficient for Mm-hmm. Uh, working families of this country, and how can we make it more resilient uh, for regular folks that are just trying to make the ends meet and save for a better future? But I mm-hmm. also understand the frustrations people have as to why can't you do things faster? Why can't you do things uh, more novel? And we're here sort of sticking to our law, our economics, but we're doing that 
so everything survives court challenge, which is inevitable on the other end as well. But I thank you, John, for uh, doing this interview. Who knows? Maybe we'll do another one in 2023. No, thank you. And I, and I want to thank our, our, the people who sent in so many of those questions. Thank you and uh, much appreciate the time. All right. Thank you. You be well. Thank you, sir. All right, everybody. Well, that was uh, our, our interview with Gary Gensler, who is the uh, chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. I'm sure that you are not satisfied. I am not. I'm, by the way, very gracious uh, of him to, to spend the time with us. I think uh, it's, it's clear. Uh, the frustration, I want to thank everybody who sent in questions. God knows uh, when we asked you if you had questions for uh, Mr. Gensler, you, you, you rose to the challenge and sent us the ones without curse words. I think we had at least 3,000 without curse words. With curse words, I have no idea how many, but there was a lot of curse words. You're a very colorful uh, audience. Uh, but we're going to continue to talk about the issues that were brought up. And by the by, uh, the next episode of the Apple TV Plus version of The Problem is on taxes and how everybody fucking hates them. And perhaps the reasons why. Uh, so I hope you'll tune in for that. Thanks so much. Thank <laughs> you.